Hello and welcome to another ATP uh, video. I was going to say ATP geopolitics video. It's not. It's an atypical philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce, and I'm really happy to be joined again for the second time, actually, uh, by my guest James Croft. We spoke uh, previously in a another interview that you can all uh, check out on my channel in the back catalogue. Let's just go and see if I can. Uh, share that with you before I get him to introduce himself. Here it is. There is the previous video, and he hasn't changed a bit. Uh, uh, yes, I have. I've changed a lot. That's really embarrassing. Is showing my. Uh... When did we meet last time? Actually, not too long ago, but uh, it, oh. it was just before you had just kind of handed your notice in in your last job. So actually, that's oh, a great that's a great segue. Let Let's talk about where you were. To, to then understand where you are now and why you've gone to where, where you are. So talk us through what your previous job, job was and uh, who you are and why you were in that job and, and why you decided to move on. I used to have one of the most unusual jobs in the world, and now I have probably just a slightly less unusual one. I used to be what's called the leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis. Ethical societies are like humanist churches, right? So imagine a religious congregation, take out all the religion and you get an ethical society. So it was a community that met weekly on Sunday mornings with music and a talk on an ethical or spiritual issue. And it had all the kind of programming you would expect from a local congregation like book groups and service projects and activism, but there was no God or traditional religion in the picture. It was just people trying to do our best in this one life we have. And it was my full-time job to lead that congregation. I moved to St. Louis, Missouri eight years ago or so, almost nine years ago now, to take up that role there. And then I um, yeah, did that for for, almost the last decade and which is then, I, I guess yeah. uh, that's a precursor to the sunday assembly you know it's a more established yes. version of the sunday assembly that, that kind of took those ideas on and then added a few bells and whistles i guess in terms of cultural things would you would you agree yeah i think there are lots of links between the sunday assembly and ethical culture so ethical culture was founded about 145 years ago now started in new york city and it, it was quite similar in terms of its goals to Sunday Assembly, in terms of keeping what was good about a religious gathering, but removing the theistic and traditional religious beliefs. So it could be open to everybody, regardless of what their religious beliefs were. I think if people have been to Sunday Assemblies, they tend to be very high energy, lots of pop music and power ballads and things like that. And they have a more sort of revival feel. Ethical societies are more in the sort of mainline Protestant feel in terms of their, they're slightly more emotionally um, placid. And um, church, be... the Church of England version of, of yes. humanism and atheism. Yes, right? exactly. If, if the Sunday Assembly is sort of the evangelical version, then uh, we're the sort right. of Church of England version of the nice. same nice. thing. Nice. And of course, so you did that for a number of years. And then, you know, just like anyone, you, you I gather you felt like it was time for a change, uh, a change of direction. And, uh, and you took a step away from that without knowing where you were going to go. Is that right? That's right. I got to I got them through COVID. So I, I took over senior leadership of the congregation about around when COVID hit and we had to close down. And it was obviously an enormous challenge to transfer everything that we were doing, which was all in person. We really had no online programming whatsoever prior to COVID, and we put it all online. And so we went from one Sunday when we met in person to the next Sunday where we met online. And in that week, we'd created a whole weekly set of online programs, including discussion groups and just hangouts and things like that. And I, I'm really proud of what we did. We had a... Um, a membership, many of whom were not digital natives, many of whom required a lot of handholding to get to the point where they were comfortable using Zoom and other streaming platforms. But we got there. We really maintained the community and kept a feeling of togetherness. And so I was really happy by what we achieved. 
but it was incredibly draining. And I felt that at the end of that period, when we got back in person, I had got to the point where I couldn't feel the same sort of energy. Now my puppy in the background is barking. So that's Ella. If you can hear Ella in the background, she's knocking on the window. So I apologize about that. Hopefully she'll stop it. Then get no, no problem if, it, if it's any consolation. Uh, I've double booked this afternoon with my twin 13 and 12 year old boys, almost 13, have booked a boys' afternoon and evening in with like all their mates to like do gaming and then jump in like the 12 foot pool. So if I've got screaming kids around, you know, sorry about that. Okay, so this is this is Ella. She comes to work with me, she's lovely, she's very, very protective of my office. So when people walk past the window, she thinks she needs to protect me. So apologies. Yes, I got to the end of COVID. I felt like I'd, I'd given the congregation all the energy that I had. And I didn't have the same sort of the, the reserves of creativity and passion for it that I had when I began. And I didn't think it would be fair to continue to lead them when I really couldn't muster up the same energy that I had at the beginning. And also, my husband and I had been thinking of returning to my native England. I'd been in the States for 15 years at that point, and we, we had wanted to move back to the UK. So those two things came together, and it seemed like a good idea to move. But as you said, I didn't know what I was going to do. And it was a bit scary because I had a very unusual job. There, there's only a handful of people in the world who professionally lead humanist communities. It really is a tiny handful of people. And for me, it was a vocation. It was a big part of my identity. It's what I had wanted to do with my life for a number of years. And so giving that up felt like I was giving up part of myself. And I was mm -hmm. very afraid there being no equivalent organizations in the UK that I wouldn't be able to find something that would enable me to live out my passion in quite the same way. So I was incredibly lucky and grateful when the University of Sussex, which is where I am now in my office there, um, was looking for a new university chaplain and they foolishly hired me. Oh, look, you've got the, the news article there. And that makes me the first humanist to lead a university chaplaincy in the UK ever. Um, so, so, so I was very surprised. That is, that's it. What, what does chaplaincy mean? Right. So a chaplain has historically been basically a member of the clergy who serves in a secular institution rather than in a religious one. So when we think of a chaplain, think of a rabbi who works in a hospital instead of a synagogue or a priest in a prison, um, employed, not incarcerated, or someone like a, an imam who works in a university. So they are still a professional representative of their religious worldview, but they are employed by a secular institution to serve the needs of the population in that institution. But so I presume chaplaincy... you normally have a number of different uh, religions being represented there. Are you the, are you the head chaplain? Like, I am. Right. Yes. So how it usually works on many university campuses, because, of course, we've got more than 20,000 students. They represent a wide variety of religious perspectives, students from all over the world. 20 percent or more of our students are international. So people come from all over the world to study here. So there's lots of different religions represented and many students who are not religious. And so my job is to work with a team of chaplains. We have about 15 associate chaplains who work with me to provide for spiritual, religious and ethical life on campus. And so we have Catholic chaplain, Anglican chaplain. Um, we have two Jewish chaplains, Orthodox and progressive Jewish chaplains. We have a Muslim chaplain. So we try and have a wide range of beliefs and philosophies represented that reflects the diversity of our community. And I coordinate all that work. That's interesting. So are they all paid for by the university or are there other are organizations not. that chip in? Right. OK. Right. So often at universities, they'll there'll be one or two um, people employed by the university. In that case here, it's me. I'm the only university employee. So that's why right. I'm the university chaplain. Right. right. And then the, the other people either volunteer their time 
or they are sort of seconded from a local religious community or a denominational body. So, for instance, yeah. the Catholic Church sends someone to us, and that yeah. is their job. Um, with the Church of England person, we are in um, a... Uh, I can't remember the word of a catchment area of a church, but we, you know, we're in the parish of a particular church in the area and the vicar of that church becomes our Anglican chaplain and some right. of his time is spent on campus. So the, the arrangement varies depending on who the other associate chaplain is, but none of those people are employed by the university in that capacity. And you're also a lead faith advisor, which I presume is a kind of a similar sort of role, or is that completely different? I don't know. So that's just part of the same title. Yeah. It's just a yeah. very wonderfully pompous, long title. And it's very interesting. It, it, it raised some interesting questions about, well, if I don't consider myself a person of faith, how can I be lead faith advisor for the university? But I think that actually those questions are ones that a lot of our students are grappling with. Because right now, we saw at the recent census, the UK has become a Christian minority country for the first time. Yeah. When it comes to young people, a huge proportion of them say that they are not religious and a massive proportion of them don't regularly practice any religion. And so the model of university chaplaincies that used to be in place where people would come to the university with a sort of assumption that they might have some religious background and they'd plug into the student society representing that background, that's completely fallen apart because most of our students have no real association with a religious community or practice when they come here. So we're having to re-envisage what chaplaincy looks like because of those changing demographics. So I think that the sort of tension in the title is quite appropriate, actually. Mm. Well, I want to come on to exactly what you're talking about, like the religious profile of modern students. I think that's really interesting in the demographic shift so that represents. I've just written a uh, an article for Only Sky talking about a landmark high court win for UK humanism. So this is to do with in religious education in the UK, you have these sacred or S-A-C-R-E. These are kind of like groups that meet to discuss the RE syllabus in every county council. And there's a group within that group called Group A that is religious representatives from each faith, but never traditionally or at least Kent County Council didn't see a humanist as being a role on that and being able to give the input into religious education, which does include humanism as a kind of idea. So they, they were taken to court and, and they lost because it was overt discrimination. But there's this the, one of the main kind of arguments, I think, for the Kent County Council we're using is that humanism isn't a religion, which kind of pertains to what you are saying. Uh, go and check that out, peeps, if you're interested. But yeah, you you were kind of talking about the idea that actually you don't have faith, and therefore you know if the definition, the usual definition of religion is you know a, a belief in a god and all the stuff around that, and yeah, that's not a very good definition. There are better definitions, uh, but uh, uh, in fact. A religion is defined as a personal set of institutionalized or, or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, belief, and practices, uh, the service of worship of a god or the supernatural, commitment or devotion to religious faith or observance. So that doesn't, you know, humanism doesn't fall under that. But you are, I guess, in your role and in the case of this court case, humanism is a kind of religion for kind of legal, practical reasons, right? So it's a complicated question, and I think you're really right to, to ask the question, what is a religion? What's the role of humanism within these sort of interfaith contexts? For me, I think it's very easy to get bogged down in trying mm. to clearly define these very complex terms, when what I like to think about at the university level is who is the student and staff body we're serving? What are their different religious and spiritual identities? How can we make sure we're serving them all? And in that context, because such a significant proportion of our student and staff are not religious, it would seem to me to be a dereliction of duty not to have anyone of that similar perspective yeah. on the chaplaincy team. And that's a, a position many universities are taking where having a humanist as part of the chaplaincy team is becoming more and more common. And I think that's good. I, I think it's good too that here in Brighton, 
which I think was found to be the least religious city in the United Kingdom in the same census, at least at the very doesn't, top. Doesn't surprise yes. me one No, iota. it doesn't surprise me. That's why I no. chose to move here. It's very secular. Um, and so the, the council does have a sacre, one of those advisory bodies to religious education, and it does involve a representative of Brighton Humanists, the humanist organization in the city. So we here do have some history of engaging humanists actively in interfaith work. And I, I think that's very important. It's, it's important for a lot of reasons. Firstly, because there are a lot of non-religious people, but we still have values and views about how life should be lived, and that should be recognized. But also because getting into the sorts of discussions that we're having now actually enriches the experience for everyone. I think it, it's good for Christian students, for instance, to be in a milieu where non-religious worldviews and life stances are recognized and explored because it gives them a perspective that otherwise they might not encounter. It's good for Muslim students. It's good for Jewish students. So it's not just good to include humanists for non-religious people. It actually deepens and complexifies the discussion of religion and worldviews for everyone. And I think that's another reason to do it. I don't think I've ever heard the, the verb complexify, and I love it. Um, what do you mean by serving your community then? What, do, what does that entail? I guess that's so, your, like your everyday like job, but yeah. The chaplaincy at the University of Sussex is here to serve both students and staff in a wide variety of ways, but I kind of break it down into three main components. The first is pastoral care and counseling. So we try to make sure there's always someone in this building where we're based whose students or staff can drop in and see without an appointment. We have a very well-developed system, a big well-being team with lots of therapists and counselors who people can speak to for mental health care by making an appointment. But sometimes something happens and people need to come in and speak to someone. And also sometimes people don't have a mental health issue they have an existential question or an ethical question they're wrestling with or they're trying to determine their values, which is not precisely something you might go to a therapist mm. for. Mm. And so we are there for that purpose. To provide but what if, there's, what if, what if they're a Catholic and, and there are no, there's no one of their faith? I mean, it, it, do you have to be really careful about how you couch things? What if you're moral answer to one of their questions or issues is very different to what the moral answer might be of the of the faith that they're in and you're representing that faith in a sense how, how does that work that is a great question so all chaplains here on our campus are here for all students and staff regardless of their religious beliefs they are not here just to serve their own people right so i'm i never say oh you can come to me if you're an atheist as well but if you're you know if you're a catholic if you're jewish don't speak to me you speak to the catholic chaplain you speak to the jewish chaplain they may request that and then we yeah. facilitate that but if someone just drops into chat obviously there's no guarantee that there's that match between the religious beliefs of the help seeker and the chaplain who happens to be present. Now, before I go on to say how that works, I want to point out, just because sometimes I get angry, let us be like, well, how can you help someone who believes in God? Of course, it's the same the other way around, right? So if I were a Christian chaplain and an atheist came to speak to me, same problem, right? But Christian chaplains in universities all around the country have been serving non-religious students very well for many decades, and no one has thought that is a problem. So I just want to say right from the start, I think it's fine. It's a skill that you can learn. And so how do you do it? Well, firstly, you recognize that pastoral care and counseling is not about giving answers to people. It's about helping them make sense of their own thoughts and feelings in the context of their own values. So a lot of it is listening to how they understand an issue, feeding back to them to see if you've understood correctly how they understand it, and then asking sensitive questions that help oh, this them is go coaching. deeper. It's more similar to coaching than, than advice. It's not advice giving, right? That I, unless they ask, right, they might ask, well, what do you think about this as a humanist, right? In which case I'll tell them. But unless they ask, I'm not there to say, well, a humanist view on this is this. What I'm really there to say is, well, 
given your Catholicism, you've explained these values and you think there might be intention with what you've done here and here. Can you say more about that? Okay, so this, the tension seems to be this. Is that right? Okay, can you, so you, you basically just ask questions and go deeper into their worldview. And it's something they train you to do. I mean, I'm as part of my training to be, to lead my congregation, I had to be trained in pastoral care and counseling. And that included, I mean, I was trained in that at a Christian seminary. I was the only mm -hmm. non-religious person in the class, right? And we all had to learn how to do this with each other. And so it, what I find is that if you're sensitive to the challenge of it, you can help people navigate the complexities they're trying to navigate without sharing their religious beliefs. So okay. you don't have to have a match. So this brings me on to a question earlier than I thought I would get there, which is the kind of moral tension aspect. So given, and Brighton's probably a really good example of a place because you've got you know the sexuality uh, brighton is is known for those international uh, viewers brighton is known as a place that has is quite a progressive city uh, that's yes. why i kind of had a bit of a laugh earlier when he said it's the least religious place because there, there's a lot of sexual diversity there's a lot of political diversity so on and so forth so, so brighton's a really interesting melting pot but if if you are a say yourself with your own kind of sexuality background as a humanist uh, chaplain, have someone coming to you and maybe talking about some kind of sexual issue within the context of a really maybe a fundamentalist, very strict moral, you know, scenario. It, is is there the potential for a lot of tension because your advice, even though you are going to be coaching them within their framework, like there's going to be a tension within you or within what you're saying with how you feel about certain things and and what you think the best. Uh, not advice, but how you might approach their issue? That's a really difficult question to answer because it is very complex. Your description of Brighton is right. I like to think of Brighton as a cross between San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, and Coney Island, right? So it's very, it's very, um, very progressive seaside town. Uh, fun, fact, of... fun fact, James, I went to college in Hurstbeer Point, just up the road from uh, from Brighton. Oh. So uh, I have experienced you know that's why. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But carry on. It's a centre of the LGBTQ community in the UK. And, and we've got Pride coming up next weekend. So it's it's we're preparing for absolute chaos for the entire weekend because it's a massive, massive celebration. Um, so, yes, it, it can be a challenge if someone comes to you struggling with something that is only a struggle because of religious or moral beliefs that are clearly making their lives more difficult and that I don't share, right? So if a, a very conservative Christian student were to come to me and say, well, I'm struggling with my sexuality, I think I might be gay, but it, I know it's wrong to be gay because this is what my religion tells you. And I'm an openly gay atheist, right? What am I supposed to tell them? Am I supposed to tell them, well, your religious beliefs are wrong and you should be, you should accept yourself for who you are? Part of me would like to do that, but that's not the role. And it, it can be very difficult to hold yourself back from saying something to people where you feel like they need to hear something. But you, you, what you have to do is stay within their own framework and trust that their own exploration will get them to a better place. It is explicitly not our role to proselytize or to attempt to change people's religious beliefs. It's actually prohibited. We have a um, an agreement. We have our associate chaplain sign when they agree to become a chaplain that says they will not proselytize at the university and they will not seek to recruit for their religious faith. So it would be very inappropriate of me to, for someone to come and say, these are my religious beliefs. I experience a tension between those beliefs and some other aspect of my identity. And then for me to say, well, just change your religious beliefs because they're hateful or wrong. Or can you, can or you point them... Can you point them in the direction of a, say, a religious organization within their belief that would yep. help them with that then? So if you know kind of a, like, a, a, I don't want to pick on Islam or anything, but like a, a liberal Muslim organization that supports yep. people with uh, sexuality questions or whatever. 
for example? So we've got a group, a student group on campus called Student Christian Movement. It's a series of groups around the country. It's an organization that promotes basically LGBTQ accepting Christianity, right? And so I might, if a Christian student came to me with these challenges, I might say, well, you might want to speak to some people who are members of this group because they may have an interpretation of your faith tradition that you haven't considered that might give you a different perspective. So it's totally legitimate to say, here are resources within your tradition that might open up um, a, a different perspective for you. And as I said, if people asked me for my view, right, I would give them my own view. I would be honest yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and say, this is my perspective. And on an occasion, I might say, can I share my own perspective? And if they say yeah. yes, then I would share it. The other thing that can be done in these sorts of situations is it's always expected that all our chaplains, regardless of their personal religious convictions, follow all the diversity, inclusion and equality provisions of the university. And so we will always ensure that everybody who comes to us is treated according to the standards expected by the university sort of regardless of what they think they're owed due to their religion, right? So so we can always say to them, um, I hear you think this because of your religious beliefs, but just so you're aware on campus, you know, no one is ever going to discriminate against you for your sexual orientation, mm. for your gender identity or expression or anything like that. And you are free to explore different aspects of your personality here. Because sometimes the tension comes between because students are away from home often for the first time between the environment they have been in before and the environment they're in now. And you can say, well, this is a different environment. There may be a way to explore different ways of being here than were available to you at home. But again, that's not proselytizing and telling them their religious beliefs are wrong. I, I have to be honest, I haven't yet encountered anything like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just, yeah. Yeah. But, but, it, but it's something that can come up and we're yeah. aware of the, the challenge of it. So you, I interrupted you because you were saying, right, you've got your pastoral, uh, you said you split it into three areas, what you, what you do. Uh, Very so well remembered. Just, I forgot that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so we do pastoral care and counselling. We do, we play a role in the ceremonial life of the university. So things like weddings, memorials, sometimes welcoming babies into the community. So if for some reason a student dies during their studies, might be called upon to host a memorial gathering for friends and staff who are affected by the death. It sounds unlikely, but there are 20,000 students here on campus. Sadly, it does sometimes happen that students yeah. die. So you have to respond to that or a professor might die or something like that or staff get married and you celebrate that if they want to at the university you can play a role in that so there's kind of that ceremonial function and also i feel like marking important moments in the trajectory of students through the university i'm really passionate here at sussex about creating some more kind of ritualized ways to help people feel a sense of connection to the university community and reviving some things we we did it in the past. There used to be something called the dis dissertation dash, where people would run to hand in their dissertations from, from the library to the place where they're supposed to be handed in um, on the day that they were due to hand them in. And apparently since COVID that hasn't happened. And that's the sort of thing I'd like to help revive because that just, it becomes part of the, the sort yeah. of legend of the institution and your memories of going to the place. And apparently people get increasingly wild as the, the, the um, deadline looms and wear fewer and fewer clothing and it all becomes completely wacky and wonderful. So that's the sort of thing that I see us potentially playing a role in thinking of ways where we can mark moments in the life of students so that they feel a certain specialness and connectedness to the university. And then there's a educational component, which is we're responsible for educating about religions and beliefs and for promoting interfaith discussion. We are unusual as a top research university in that we don't have a department of theology. So there's very little explicit teaching in degree courses about religion on campus. And so I think there's right. some slack to be picked up there. 
it, for the chaplaincy to do some interfaith education because increasingly people are going to work all over the world, often in countries where religion has a much stronger presence than it does in the United Kingdom. It's extremely valuable to have at the very least basic religious literacy when they leave with a degree. And so we can play a role in that. So, so that's that sort of ceremonial. Is that, is that sort of education or is that debating as well? Does it include that kind of aspect? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about encouraging more interfaith dialogue, including debates and discussions between groups with different ideas. I mean, this is a university. It should be a place where different ideas can test with each other. And I think that we should be you know, open to robust contestation of different religious ideas and philosophies. I'm actually hoping to put together for next academic year a sort of series of speakers who will explore new approaches to religion that are developing in this increasingly secularized environment because i think that there are some new things popping up that are quite interesting and worth exploring so i'm hoping to bring people in to talk about that so yes yeah debating discussion that's fascinating yeah uh, yeah um uh, as you're talking there about this increasingly secular society a couple of things so, so go back to tell us a little bit about the changing I, I know you're only new in a job so you might not have a sense of a changing religious profile of, of students throughout time but what's your grasp on a changing demographic uh, and student beliefs and 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 perhaps maybe even polarization so whereas maybe 30 years ago there the, it might have been actually less problematic than now so although it's, it's a growing secularization there's also a growing polarization so you might get actually quite robust strong evangelical forthright moralists on you know either side having at it in uh, which you might not have had sort of 30 years ago so i don't know tell me what what your thoughts are on the student religious profile is it apathetic You're, well that's a good question I can't really speak too easily to how things have changed on, for instance, UK university campuses over the past however many decades, partly because as far as I can tell, there isn't a huge amount of data specifically about university students and their religious beliefs. There's a lot of data about UK society as a whole, but I couldn't find a lot, for instance, for our university about changing religious demographics over time. It's something I've tried to find and I couldn't find it. It's certainly clear that university students are increasingly non-religious. And at the same time, as we've taken in more international students at UK universities, the religious mix has changed quite dramatically. So for instance, Sussex has had a Islamic student society for many decades. I think it was set up in the 70s and has been a major part of religious life on campus since then. And we have a lot of Muslim students and I would say easily the most active and engaged religious student society on campus is the Islamic student society, ISOC. And they have daily prayers with many participants every single day in a dedicated prayer space here on campus. And no other religious group has that level of participation on campus. It's much more than other ones. And that has increased over time because the demographics of the students that we're accepting have, has, has changed over time. So that's, uh, I think, a very positive development is the diversification of religious expression on campus. Does that lead speaking, to... Sorry, speaking, speaking to your... Sorry to interrupt, but speaking to your uh, lack of data for belief over time. Mitch says here, we're really interested to see the delta between first year students and those in the fourth year. So do you notice anything? I don't know anecdotally, is there any data to suggest that actually the more, the longer people are in education, the more they perhaps might throw off the shackles of religion? I know that that quite often- Throw off the shackles. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. You won't, you won't now say things like that, but I I can. But uh, but I, I, I suppose they, they talk about, you know, people going to Harvard Divinity School and places like this and 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 actually learning theology and ends up deconverting people, you know, quite often. So you get this element that university does that, which is why so many people in evangelical America say, no, you can't send your kids to university, they'll get ruined and all that. So it, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you're absolutely right about Harvard Divinity School. When I was a graduate student at Harvard, the best place oh, to find... You out. 
Yeah, yeah, yes. The best place to find gay atheists was at the Divinity School. Absolutely, 100%. I think almost all the students there were, were gay and atheists. The question about the changing of people's religious affiliation and practice over their time at the university, I just don't have any data on that, I'm afraid. I've been at the university six months, and I would love to know the answer to that question because I think it would be really interesting. My suspicion is that there isn't as much of a change as you might think at a UK university, just because, frankly, so few of our students come into university with a very strong religious identity, like actually going to church regularly or something like that. It's just extremely uncommon to meet students for whom that's a major part of their lives. And so I suspect in America, what you see often is people for whom that's a major part of their lives when they're living with their family, when they move away from university, it gets less and less. But because most of our students don't have that coming in, they don't lose it going out. And I suspect very yeah. few of them uh, become more religious while they're at university. But that just, raises a really I... interesting question about what's the chaplaincy for then? And that's yeah. why I think having having a humanist, I would say this, but having a humanist head of university chaplain is actually a really good opportunity to rethink, well, well, what we're trying to do is less centered around traditional religious faiths, although that's a part of it, and more about values development and worldview discernment, asking big existential spiritual questions in a broad way that can include traditional religious responses, but isn't bound by those responses. It's like uh, ethical support. It's almost like a mixture of psychology uh, and philosophy kind of in that beautiful uh, entwined way like uh, that, that's really good uh, i was just gonna i was gonna mention just a second ago like one anecdote i have i i gave i used to go and give a number of talks at southampton university to the humanist society and to um uh, and I gave one talk where they had half the audience was like Christian Union members, the other half were atheists. And I knew that. And I said at the beginning, look, uh, like the backfire effect is I'm not going to convince any Christian here not to be Christian. Like it's not going to happen. You're going to entrench in your belief system, blah, blah, blah. And you, you'll be even more Christian by the time we finish this talk. Anyway, they give the talk, meet some people in the bar afterwards. And spoke to a couple of these Christian, you, you know, young Christian students who are really up for it, but they're asking me really engaging questions. Anyway, a couple of years later, one of them sends me, uh, he reaches out on Facebook and he's like, yeah, 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 no, I'm an atheist now. And, blah, 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 and there's all, but you see this like whole journey mapped out. It's like, oh my goodness, I was part of that. That's really weird. But anyway, sorry, that's just my anecdote of like someone being religious at the beginning, not being religious at the end of the university. But uh, no, anyway, I derailed you. So sorry, continue where no. you were left off and you can remember. I, I think I had come to the end, but I think you're right that one of the purposes of a chaplaincy like ours is to give people lots of different inputs so that they can be influenced by them in their journey through the school. And where they end up is, at least to me, less important than that they've had an experience of engaging with a lot of different perspectives and mm. considering deeply their own responses to that. So my goal is obviously not to make sure that everyone goes through the University of Sussex comes out a humanist. That's totally not it. It's to make sure everybody goes through has had some deep engagement with what you might think of as religious or spiritual questions. And so we're trying to think of ways of introducing new programs that will involve students in asking those questions about their own lives and philosophies. Interesting. Um, and what were, because you, that's a kind of student thing. I mean, there's lots more to say, obviously, but we kind of talked about the student side of things. But what about the other religious leaders? How did you did you have any challenge to you taking up that position, given that you are a humanist and maybe a gay humanist? Were, are, were any of those other religious leaders or are any of them quite fundamentalist, quite strict in their moral observance and, and whatnot? Do, have you met any challenges from your fellows or from institutions maybe uh, in and around the UK or Brighton? I expected there might be some resistance to the idea of a humanist heading up a university chaplaincy, and I have not really experienced any at all. I think one thing that you have to understand about university chaplains in particular 
is that very often they tend to be people on sort of the liberal edge of their own yeah. tradition because it takes a sort of person to want to work at a university and for that to be the place where they live out their religious values. And those people tend to be people who vibe with the liberal, open, questioning ethos that universities already have. And so if you were very rigid in your religious views, it would not be a very easy fit with a university anyway, particularly a British university that tend to be in practice quite secular. So I think that's part of the reason. Another part of the reason is, I think the argument is just so strong in favor of having more and more non-religious people involved in this work just because the demographics are so clear. And you can say exactly what I've said to you today, which is, well, if potentially a majority of your students are not religious, but you have no one in your chaplaincy who represents a non-religious worldview, then how can those people feel fully included in university life? And I think that, that everyone instinctively understands mm -hmm. that there actually does have to be something changing there. And then finally, I think my own background, and I don't want to, you know, big myself up or anything, but I've, but I've said, a long I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not racist, but, but racism. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to big myself up, but I am awesome. Just, uh, I am awesome. No, I've had a very unusual career that has involved a lot of interfaith work. Yeah. A lot of my work in St. Louis was engaging with people of different beliefs to mine to do social justice work, particularly anti-racist work, ironically, given what you've just said. And that gave me a different perspective on my own humanism over the years that I worked there. I came to understand humanism differently and in a way that's more compatible with developing deep relationships with people of different beliefs than you perhaps more I pluralist. had maybe 15 years ago. Uh, yes, I've become more pluralist, but in a particular way, because I was always pluralistic in the sense that I thought, well, people can have their own beliefs and they don't have to be the same as mine. And we just sort of fight it out in the marketplace of ideas. That, that sort of pluralism. But I've moved to a different place, particularly vis-a-vis -vis religion, where it, in my mind and how I feel about it, I no longer feel like the division between religious and non-religious is especially important. What I think is important is the division between people who have open, inclusive and humane values, regardless of whether they are de derived from a religion or not and those who don't have those values, regardless of whether their values you, are derived from religion or not. Spot on, you've arrived, like we've arrived at the same place. So I, I used to be really big into like truth. You've got to like, your worldview is inaccurate, right? And I'm gonna set you right. So we're gonna have a big argument because I know you're wrong and people that are wrong, it's wrong to have people that are wrong type thing, right? And I, I've kind of like mellowed out a bit now where I'm like, if you have moral views that are really distasteful, that's where we're going to have the argument. If you are a really liberal Christian, I, I say liberal because that means you, we're going to have broadly the same moral outlook, then if, if, if your belief system doesn't have any real negative moral implications, then I'm not going to have that much of an issue with your belief. So I, I guess that's a similar sort of position, right? It is. And I think the whole cultural and political discourse is, is trending in that direction. I don't know if you follow a lot about the discussions right now over particularly hot cultural issues. So there's in the UK, this, in my mind, terrible discussion over trans rights and inclusion, which is just constantly demonizing trans people. But one of the really interesting things about the way that that conversation has unfolded is that you're increasingly seeing people who were previously new atheists, right? Peter Bogosian and someone like that, saying things that would not be would not make sense in the discourse environment of 10 or 15 years ago. Things like, well, I actually preferred when it was the old school religious people because I understood what they believed, even if I disagree with it, but, but these woke people are worse, right? So, so I'm now, you now see this situation where some of the new atheists are sort of on the side of conservative religious people 
against what they see as overly progressive moral values, right? And so that that change in the in the discourse environment has felt like, well, actually, so my allies are now more liberal and progressive political voices, whether they're religious or not. So I think I feel yeah. like there's been a shift in how that's worked out. It's really, I, I don't want to sidetrack this with with kind of discussion about woke and whatnot, but if there's a word that triggers me, that is it because like it's just basically it just means libtard i was watching peter navarro who's an american trumpist who, who gave a speech the other day kind of political speech and he he, he got anti-woke and woke in his like speech about 58 times and you're like and i just heard some of my older relatives who don't really like all my question is always well what do you define it what does woke mean to you and like i i ask you know, it's like when I have relatives go, oh, you know, these people, what's that word? Oh, yeah, woke. It's like you don't even know what the word is and you're just using it as an <laughs> insult. It's like, but it just becomes like libtard. You know, that's what it means. And it's just like, all oh, right. So and but we're finding that, as you're saying, within like, you know, you, you can be Christian, atheist and whatever. And you have these different political views. And, and that's what maybe divides us more than the religion. I think is what you're saying, which I think. Is, yes, I think know. that's becoming increasingly true. Um, so you haven't yet, thankfully, met any sort of pushback from the other religious uh, leaders in your community. Do you do you enjoy working with other religious leaders and kind of getting? I mean, talk talk me through your experiences of working in a collegiate manner with with people who are ostensibly existentially at the other end of the spectrum. I haven't had any significant pushback i was expecting there might be some so when i was appointed the times wrote an article about it and it was Ooh. it was a very good article it was it was very open and complimentary and nice it wasn't critical and i was expecting then that there might be some pushback you know because sometimes he gets some press and then other people pick it up and be like what on earth is going on this is outrageous but it still didn't happen i think someone wrote in one letter that's was critical but it was really a very positive reaction from almost everybody and that includes all my colleagues in the chaplaincy here at Sussex so as I said we've got maybe 15 associate chaplains although they're engaged more or less depending on the amount of time they're able to spend on campus and I've hugely enjoyed getting to know them and working alongside them they're people of extraordinary principle and have had some really wonderful life experiences. Our Anglican chaplain, for instance, who was recently appointed to the church just across the road. And so we're in his sort of catchment area and he leads services here every week. He has recently won no less than two awards from Islamic organizations for his support of the Muslim community against Islamophobia. He used to be based in East London, where the East London mosque was. And so he did a lot of work bringing the community wow. together to oppose the far right there. And he's won two quite significant awards for that work. And so I feel a, a lot of kinship with someone like that, someone who sees in their faith a call to social justice and solidarity with other people, reaching out across lines of difference to find common values, what I would think of as common human values, and to fight against hatred. And so I feel really privileged to work alongside colleagues like that. I think they're fantastic. They've been very welcoming and they're great. In, in the same kind of vein, uh, have you experienced issues with religious extremism, right? So although there is a need to draw religious communities together. Are there times where you you have thought ah, that that kind of activity on the campus or that those kind of beliefs are, are problematic and, and act against, you know, go against the, the, the tide of, or, you know, your views on, on progressive inclusivity? I haven't seen anything that's really made me worried on our campus yet. Something that people may not understand, particularly if they're from the US, is that UK university campuses and the student societies that operate on them have to operate under a set of rules and guidelines and even legislation. That means that there is some oversight over what they do. And when it comes to religious groups, there are certain things that religious groups are allowed to do on campus and there's certain things that they're not allowed to do. And so there is some sort of mechanism for ensuring 
that really problematic behaviors don't happen on campus. Mm. There are some organizations who may wish to create a student group on campus where we would have to think carefully about how we facilitated that or if we facilitated that because of those guidelines. It's not something that's come up yet. I have a suspicion it's something that might come up fairly shortly, but so far I haven't really seen anything that is very objectionable. And it's not my job to really police it. You know, I'm not yeah, going around course. to the different student group societies. I do go to their meetings and I try and meet the students who run these societies. Uh, another thing that American listeners might not understand is that students unions at UK universities are separate charities. And so the body that runs all the student societies at our university is not actually part of the university itself. And so they have their own staff and they have their own funding streams and then they work within the university and put on events at the university. But I don't run or oversee those societies. We work in partnership, but I'm not responsible for what they do. So I've made relationships with these the, the students who run these societies. I go to their events occasionally to be seen and to build relationships. If I saw something that I thought was outrageous, like an outrageously homophobic speaker or something that was I felt was really harassing students, not just expressing a view, but really harassing students, we, we would have a conversation about that. But generally, it's been a very positive experience. I haven't seen anything that really worries me at all. That leads on to my next question. But before I get there, Carrie Ann Chrysler says, what kind of prohibitions are in place to protect the public against extreme faiths? So the sorts of prohibitions. So we're a, a public university. We're a state funded university. Our campus is open to the public, which actually gives our chaplaincy another role, which is we sometimes have members of the public coming in looking for help or we provide educational programming that is open to the public as well. Our campus is totally open. People can just walk in um, and come to our building and see what's happening. And it happens every week. Someone will just walk in and be like, what's this building? And so we do have a public facing role. Most of the policies that are in place are there to protect students and staff and their general sort of anti-harassment, anti-discrimination policies. So it is not allowed for student societies in the guise of a religious event to have someone on campus who would engage in sort of hate preaching, the sort of thing you sometimes see on US university campuses, people with sandwich boards that say, you know, God hates gays or whatever, things like that. And they stand there on, on in public universities with a megaphone. I, I think that would not be allowed here. And that would we'd actually be able to stop that by saying this is against the policies that but this is harassment and you're not, it's just not very British. No, we do have a different speech environment. And that's something yeah, that sometimes yeah. surprises US students when they come here is yeah. that actually, you know, every talk that happens on campus goes through a process to determine what sort of accommodations are necessary. Usually, in almost all cases, not to determine whether it can happen or not. The assumption is it will happen, but it's whether we need to facilitate a safe environment for it. So if a speaker is invited for whom there might be security concerns or something, a plan has to be made to how to manage those concerns. But every single one goes through that process. So it is there is some oversight to these sorts of things. This, this is the question I, that I was going to come to, which is uh, always a bit of a prickly one, which is free, free, free speech issues. And, and this is not such a problem in the UK, although with the kind of way that we're going in certain um, entities trying to harness the culture wars uh, mechanisms that we see in the US, in the US political arena, particularly with the GOP, the, the Republican Party in the US being quite well known for not necessarily having many policies and therefore deciding to go more on campaigning on culture war issues. We are seeing that more in the UK and where we had this whole thing in, in, in the US with uh, cancel, cancel culture and, and US universities and safe spaces and all this stuff. We have seen that elements of that over in the UK. I mean, Turning Point as a, as a group was, I think, started in the UK and has been exported back to the US where it's kind of got a more natural home. But what are your views on sort of free speech? And is that an issue within UK universities? 
Yes, it is an issue, and it's going to increasingly become an issue as, as you say, the polarization of political discourse continues, and we continue to, I think, sadly import some of US political culture into the UK, which I think is really unstoppable at this point with new news outlets like GB News and stuff like that, basically trying to replicate some of the more polarized political discourse. I think that's very bad. I think it's mm. sad that that's happened. Ha having spent 15 years in the United States, one of the reasons I wanted to leave was because politics is so terrifying there. It's so unpleasant. And so it's not so much that it's polarized. Sometimes people think that the polarization of the discourse is itself the problem. I don't necessarily think that's it. It's that one side of the discourse has become so disconnected from reality and so extreme that it is destroying the pillars necessary for a free and liberal society to continue. And that's really, really scary. I mean, the, the speed at which falsehoods are spread by major political figures in the United States is very scary, and we don't want to get to that position here. How does that manifest itself on campus? Well, it certainly does on some very difficult issues more than others. You have probably heard that the government has just appointed a new free speech czar whose role it is to promote free speech on university campuses. So it's definitely an issue where there is a political discussion about it and the conservatives clearly feel like there is some political mileage to be gained by so making is that, it is that perception issue. is that perception becomes reality rather than reality in influence of perception as in uh, is this a case where they, they are realizing that this is a they can capitalize on the culture wars narrative. And actually there isn't that much of a free speech issue in UK universities, but we're going to say it is because if we tell you that it, it, there, there is this issue, then you'll get scared and, and freaked out and vote, vote conservative type thing. Yes. That's what I, in my personal capacity as James Croft. Yes. I think that's exactly what is happening. I can just speak to my experiences on this campus over the last six months. I don't feel there is any challenge to students' ability to express themselves freely, to explore different and difficult ideas, to put forward uncomfortable ideas that challenge their classmates or challenge their professors. I don't see that. Amusingly, I sometimes hear expressed that there is such a problem. For instance, we have a, a weekly theological discussion group here that brings in some former staff and members of the public as well to discuss issues. And sometimes they have expressed that concern that they think universities are becoming places where no one can do free speech and they can't speak their mind. I find it amusing that they're saying this while engaged in an event that is explicitly to foster free speech and dialogue at a university campus. And so I often have to remind them, well, you know, you're saying your view and they're saying their view and here we are at a university. So what, no, no one, no thunderbolts have, have come from the sky. So I, I think it is to a large degree a confected fear myself. Obviously, universities are spaces of political and cultural contestation. They mm. always have been for decades. You look at through the Thatcher years, you look at during the Cold War, Vietnam, have huge student protests over profoundly political issues. And we are going through a period of increased student activism again. And they will criticize their professors when they think that they're wrong. And they will protest if they think the university has made a bad decision. And of course, no one should ever be bullied or threatened. So death threats are unacceptable. Making people feel scared at work is unacceptable. It, they shouldn't engage in that level. That's something that could legitimately rise to the level of harassment. But I think it's a worry when people feel like, students expressing their speech is actually a threat to free speech on campus rather than an act of free speech on campus, which yeah. is what I actually think it is. Students do have a right to protest. I mean, I'll give you an example. We, we had our graduation just last week 
saw more than 3,000 students graduating with their degrees from Sussex over five days, 13 graduation ceremonies, watched by people all over the world. It was very moving and very powerful. And there were some student protests during particularly one of the ceremonies in favor of the marking and assessment boycott, the workers who are striking right now to increase their pay and conditions. And what I was really impressed by was how gracefully all the staff accepted the students' expression of their political views and how it didn't, we didn't make them feel shame by it. They, while they were collecting their degrees, they engaged in various forms of protest. It, one of our, our honorary graduates that day was Peter Hain, the Lord Peter Hain, the, the legendary um, anti-apartheid activist who has done much social justice activism in his life. And he even expressed solidarity with the workers who were striking at, at his acceptance of an honorary doctorate from the university. And it was, I think I felt like this is part of what we're teaching these students to do. We're teaching them to raise their voice against what they see as injustice. If that means making a political statement back to the university, the university can take that. We're big enough to take that, and we understand. That that's do, do, do you, are you fine with that when you accord with their sentiments? What if those sentiments were kind of more extreme right-wing views that you might not agree with? Would you be saying the same thing? So I have to first say, and this is something I have to be careful with, that the chaplaincy at the University of Sussex is explicitly neutral because the chaplaincy is a neutral space during industrial yeah. disputes where people who are on strike and not on strike can come to talk to our chaplains about how right. they're feeling about everything. And so I was not expressing support for the issue. I was expressing my view that it's perfectly acceptable for students to protest and yeah. that they did so in what I thought was a, a dignified and creative way. And I thought right. the, the okay. university responded well. So just to be very clear about that. Yeah. So, um, but, but that's always the test, right? It's always the test of our commitment to free speech is if we still support it when it's a protest for something that we don't agree with. Mm -hmm. And I think that on campus, if a student group wanted to protest something and I thought that that student group was very wrong, I would still be in support of their right to protest as long as it doesn't raise to that level of harassment or hate speech yeah that's that's, that's the the classic issue is where does it become you know it's drawing the line of like okay that's now hate speech or okay that's you know oppressive or whatever and it's like that arbitrary line that you kind of have to feel your way towards i i guess yes but, it is difficult but i but i want to stress that i think that most uk universities and schools in fact are doing a pretty good job actually navigating these difficult challenges. I think about a recent report that came out of a conservative leading think tank in the UK. I forget exactly the think tank, but it was basically a report into woke stuff in schools. And they, they claimed that they, they had uncovered through surveying parents and students at UK schools an epidemic of wokery in, in the UK schools. And I went in and investigated the data that they provided in support of this claim and found that it was complete nonsense. They asked students, do you feel that you can safely express a different view to your classmates in, in the classroom? And I think it was more than 80% said yes, right? The, the actually very high, overwhelming percentages of students felt like their school did a good job, this is secondary schools, promoting a free speech environment. That's what the students themselves said in a report that was conducted by a right-leaning think tank. So if that's the case, I think that this worry over free speech is a, a little bit overplayed. Yeah. Uh, I find it interesting. So Arif Ahmed here is uh, a well-known atheist philosopher. I mean, he's debated William Lane Craig, if I remember correctly. And uh, I've seen a number of his debates. In fact, Mitch Mitch Mazzarol in, in live chats also uh, recognised that too. Uh, it's, so it's interesting that he's become the free speech star. Is this a kind of Peter Bogosian uh, situation or is he genuinely you know, a good person for that job to find out. I mean, I, I, I haven't looked into it. When his, that appointment was made, I've been so busy doing other things. I raised a couple of eyebrows, which is both eyebrows, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, and then promptly didn't have time to look into it. Oh, do you have any thoughts on that? Or 
I'm wondering how many eyebrows you have now. 17, 17. So you raised a couple of them. I think that firstly, from what I know about his history, he has had a long commitment to free speech on university campuses. And he's he's had a background speaking out about those issues from his perspective. I'm not saying that I share his perspective, but I, I don't think it's a completely out of left field appointment. He's a genuinely respected academic mm -hmm. who has a history of being concerned with this issue. I don't think... I'm concerned that some of the things that this free speech czar seems to want to do will actually end up chilling student speech on campus rather than promoting it. And it is a difficult thing. I mean, you can protest other speech in a way that genuinely chills speech. But on the other hand, protest is a form of speech. So you have to navigate it carefully. And I'm worried, particularly given the record of this government who appointed him. This is the government, remember, that ran through historic restrictions on people's rights to protest just in time for the coronation and then arrested a bunch of activists against the monarchy for no good reason. And they appointed this guy. So they're not exactly people who I trust with protecting free speech. So I have to say I'm skeptical. A good, a good answer there, James. Well, look, I think that's um, we're sort of meandering to, towards a conclusion. So we, we've, I, I've got a good sense of, of your appointment, uh, what you'll do. I mean, actually, Talk me through a, a day in your life. Like, what what are the sorts of emails that you get? What are the sorts of phone calls you get? Who who knocks on your door? It can be very various, which is one of the reasons I love this line of work, which is it can mm. it can differ day to day. But I might receive emails from staff or students about issues that they're having. So someone might make an appointment with me to speak about something that's on their mind. And so I'll have to respond to that. Are these, so, someone... these, are, are these personal issues, like, I mean, are you a, a bit of a yep. counsellor, basically? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a counsellor in the sense of a medical practitioner. We're not medical practitioners, yeah. but, but I offer pastoral care and counselling. So if someone wants to come talk to me about a relationship breakup or a bereavement in their family, these are the sorts of issues I'm available. Sometimes someone will literally, you know, a couple of weeks ago, someone just turned up floods of tears and needed to speak to someone and the door is usually open for them to come in and chat and have a biscuit and a cup of tea and i have a special kettle just for that and they can they can you know sit down and talk about what's on their mind so that's part of it just being present sometimes i speak at events on campus on campus I sometimes am off campus because part of the role is maintaining positive relationships between the university, which is a major civic institution in the region, and local religious groups. So last week I was at the Bishop of Chichester's Palace for a reception for Sussex da -da -da. educational institutions. I know I felt very, very posh, very privileged to attend a reception at the at the palace of the Bishop of Chichester. It was actually really fun. It was good to meet other colleagues in other universities in the area. So building relationships with other religious groups in town is, is important. Sometimes I play a sort of broader educational role in the community. So I've been on BBC Radio Sussex a couple of times now to give their one minute sermon on Sunday mornings and to talk about religion and spirituality from the perspective of our chaplaincy and to update them on what's going on at the university. So there's a bit of a role of representing the university in the area of religion and belief yeah. in different settings. And sometimes that's, that's it's something... meeting with other so, stuff. So uh, uh, before we went live, I, I mentioned how your epoch, uh, you know, changing role the fact that you are this, as you said yourself, this tongue in cheek, obviously, you know, but, you know, this is a brand new role. Well, it's not a brand new role, but it's it's never before been given to a humanist. And so right. this is this is a, a big moment for humanism in the UK. But there's still this thing. So for the international viewers, we have BBC Radio 4, which is your talk radio. That's BBC. So it's public service broadcasting. And it's it's very sort of it's not traditional, but it is a tradition, I guess. 
and part of that is the thought for the day that's like in the in the morning news in the today program smack in the middle of it you get like a couple of minutes of a religious person giving their thought for the day and there's been this pressure for there to be a humanist giving a humanist thought for the day for decades now and the bbc has not relented quite oddly i i it's bizarre why that hasn't changed given the demographic shifts but here you are chipping away at that kind of area and so you know it these things i think are linked and it's it's just important for humanism to be recognized and to take a seat at the table humanist thought for the day when yes we're gonna get that done i'm i'm convinced we're gonna make that the first time that'll happen will be in my lifetime i hope well, so you, you know, yes. mate, mate, you you're the man for it because no, I you... totally want to do it. If you're listening, yeah. BBC Radio Four, I will do thought for the day for you. The, the mate, it is a mate, weird mate, thing, but you've done it on BBC Radio Sussex. As honestly, I I'm have. sure there are people there will be like have a word like oh, oh thanks James, we really appreciate that again. You came on a short notice, really. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Have a word to Radio Four. You mates at Radio Four, would you? Well, the, it's just such a weird thing, and it's something that's difficult, I think, for US listeners in particular to understand, because so Radio 4 is like NPR, right? It's basically very similar in terms of programming and tone to something like NPR in the States. And it has this daily slot for a religious reflection. And even though the country is very, very not religious in terms of religious practice, particularly there still is this institutional core where particularly the Church of England has disproportionate influence. And that's true in the House of Lords, where there are the Lords spiritual, who are literally bishops who sit in the House of Lords and have an input on legislation and not elected by anyone. And it's true in various areas of the cultural sector, like on the BBC where there are programs like I don't think there's been a humanistic songs of praise either. And there, there are all these. I wrote, of... I wrote this article, uh, what, two weeks ago now or so about the bishops, about the Lord spiritual. And will they lose the automatic right to sit on the House of Lords? Because there's been a, a, a chair, a humanist chair committee like of politicians who have who have basically called for it to end. But anyway, uh, sorry to. Yes. Carry on. So it's a weird thing that, that the populace of this country is getting more and more secular and religiously diverse, but the sort of cultural institutions of our country still have a disproportionate Church of England influence. I think that's fair to say. And that's partly because we have a state church. But I, I don't understand and I've never understood the resistance to a humanist thought for the day on Radio 4 in particular, because it, I think people assume that what's going to happen is someone's going to go on and they're going to spend that time to tell religious people why they're wrong. Well, that I have no interest in that whatsoever. What I would be interested in doing is demonstrating that you can have a profound, moving, intellectually engaging presentation that just happens not to be religious. So if you're listening, thought for the day, people, book me now. I'm going to start this campaign. I'm going to do a Twitter poll. I'm sure that makes all the difference. <laughs> it will make all the difference if you do it, not if I do it. Uh, well, look, James, uh, I've really appreciated the time uh, we've had speaking. This has been really interesting. I'm, I just I feel I don't often get to talk about stuff like this, like literally people's jobs, and but in the interfaith community. And, and I, I found it fascinating. Is there anything that you feel that you haven't said that you would like to say? Only that if you're ever around Brighton, you are always welcome to come to the University of Sussex campus and visit the Meeting House. It is a beautiful, grade two star listed Basil Spence building. It is stunningly gorgeous and uh, come in any time during the week and I, I should be there and I'll say hello. Cup of tea and biscuits are on yes. you. That is for sure. Well, uh, look, James, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the people in the live chat uh, having a little chinwag at the side there. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm going to put in my description below, this is just a random aside, uh, there are 
courses that are done through MythVision that you can take uh, that gives my channel a bit of a kickback. And if you decide to take they're really uh, well-priced courses, I'll whack them in the description. They're not there at the moment, but I forgot to do that. Uh, so that'll be the end of all my videos. Just uh, it's great to uh, support these YouTube channels who are providing the, this. That's Derek at MythVision that's, that's sorting out those courses. Uh, but if, for, for this now, thank you so much, James. Really appreciate it. To stay online uh, for the time being. Uh, thank you to everyone else. Take care and uh, toodle pips. And thought for the day, final words from James Croft, a uh, humanist uh, lead <laughs> advisor. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. It's a masterful thought. Thanks, mate.